We're good to go. Good morning, guys. So today is part two of I'm Happy Now. What are we talking about? I'm happy now. There's got to be three major points because there's always three major points. So when you go home today and they say, what that preacher even bothered to talk about? We know what we talked about. Point number one is evidence of Christianity. Again, point number one is evidence of Christianity. Point number two, I'm in control when I have self-control. Point number two, I'm in control when I have self-control. This is like when you're working on the car and your knuckles lose some skin. I'm in control when I have self-control. Point number three, it feels good to be good to others. Point number three, it feels good to be good to others. So, let's talk about it. We want to talk about the Christian life and what makes us happy. Go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 through 2 through 23. It's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. We want to talk about in our own lives how happiness relates to the fruits of the Spirit. It's very interesting because a lot of people talk about, well, if you become a Christian, you're going to just be happy. And life's supposed to be good because God now takes care of you. Like He doesn't take care of people before. God takes care of everybody. Are there certain benefits that you have as a Christian? Sure, sure. But it doesn't mean you're not going to have moments of unhappiness. And happiness is a level of choice. And that's easier said than done. Sorry, I forgot to point this thing. Okay. So, moving on. We're going to go to a little story in Philemon chapter 1, verses 8 through 22. Guys in Bible study kind of already got this a little bit, but I want to give it because I think it is so important to understand that there was a man named Philemon. Philemon, who had a slave. The slave's name was Onesimius. And Onesimius basically ran away and was no longer doing what he was supposed to do. So he wronged his owner, Philemon. But in this process, Onesimius ended up getting saved and learning about Christ and so forth. And it was time that Onesimius needed to go back to Philemon <laughs> And make things right. So Paul was going to write a letter because Paul helped bring Philemon to the Lord. And Paul wanted to, to help orchestrate things here. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon and says, Hey, I want you to consider one Simeus. I know that he's done some things wrong for you. And so this is what it says. So he says, um, basically, I appeal to you for my son, one Simeus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So, for, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. He's standing on behalf. Have you everybody ever seen somebody we talk about people that have influence? And, you know, when, when you're calling it, like when I was a kid, we would go to the gas station. This is back when you can just charge. We'd go to the gas station, and I would just say, we'll charge this to Don Lukens. And they'd write his, okay, we'd put candy bars or whatever. But Grandpa always said, just charge it to me. They know who I am. They know who I am. I'll take care of it. So we never had to have money. We'd just walk to the gas station. We'd, would get something. Yeah, it was a small little town, and it was the only gas station in town. And that was just how things were done. That same concept happens here, where, where Paul's saying, hey, 
listen, this is our friend. And I know that he made a mistake, and I know that he really did you wrong. But his friend's here. Would you consider taking him back? He goes on to say, if he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Evidence of Christianity. We make mistakes. We have to fix mistakes. And there's a level of happiness in fixing the mistake. Have you ever felt that barrier with somebody where you, you want to go talk to somebody and you're, you're like, man, I really, we, I, we still need to kind of deal with that unfinished business. And it's almost difficult to approach them or talk to them because there's a barrier here. And then you see them in the grocery store and you're like, we should go this way. Because you don't really want to go talk to them. You don't want to deal with the issue at hand. And it doesn't make you happy. When you're trying to avoid somebody, you're going like this with your face. I mean, really, is that happy? Is that happiness? No, there's not happiness in that. The, there's a, a jillion different scriptures in the Bible about happiness. But I wanted you to see happiness being modeled. When, when Simeus makes things right, sometimes you have to ask for somebody else to kind of help you out. Because it is hard. It is hard to go face people and say, hey, listen. It's been tough. You know, we, we just celebrated a wedding anniversary. I tell you, my, it's hard sometimes, my own marriage, to be like, hey, I have to eat crow on this one. I, 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 I was, I was, I made it, I, I didn't do something right. <laughs> because we want to be right all the time. We, we, we don't want to ever make a mistake. But the fact is, is as Christians, we make mistakes. And even before we're Christians, we've made mistakes. And there are things we've done in our past that will always be done in our past. You can't erase it. But the good thing is, is that God forgives us for it. And it's accepting the forgiveness that gives us the happiness. It's making the situation right with somebody else that gives us the happiness. So the real happiness comes in the evidence of Christianity when we fulfill the fruits of the Spirit. And the joy comes when we make it right, when we fix it. And sometimes we have to go to great lengths. As Paul talked about there, we go to great lengths to fix it sometimes. It happens. You know, my uncle always said when we did something wrong, he's like, all the sorries in the world will never bring back somebody's eye, you know? And, and it's true, it doesn't. But the fact of the matter is, is the sorry can give us a level of relief, repentance. And we get to go forward in life. Jesus says our sins as far as the east is from the west, he remembers them no more, it's over. So we've talked about this many times. We'll always talk about it. Because it's hard sometimes to accept some of the things that we've done and realize that we can move forward. So point number two. I'm in control when I have self-control. We're going to go to John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. This is a moment that is tough. I can only imagine for Jesus. Here Jesus is. His friend Judas who he knew would betray him, betrays him, brings some guards along, and now it's time for Judas to turn Jesus over to the guards to be captured. This is a moment we get to watch self-control. I could tell you sometimes, like we talk about with the wrench, I can't stand up here and tell you I've never thrown a wrench or a hammer or other thing. It's, it's hard when you're working on a car. Cars are my most frustrating thing, you know. They make the spot. My arm can't fit in there. I need to like have some widget to get up there and move the wrench that far so I can get some. It makes me crazy. I totally understand that level of frustration. Kind of like in traffic. I don't know what's going on with I-25, but nobody's getting up and down that road anymore. I, it's making me nuts. Everybody's cutting me off, cutting me off, cutting me off. 
And you know, I need to replace my brakes. They're squeaking, it's bothering me. I gotta get the brakes fixed. And so I'm trying not to have to use them too terribly much. And everybody's cutting me off, cutting me. And I'm in control when I have self-control. I'm in control. Oh, bless you, my friend. Thank you for cutting me off for the sixth time. It's not like you're in danger in anybody's life. I, I get it. So let's read this. It says, when he finished praying, this is Jesus. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron, Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. See, this is back in the day before they texted each other. Just remind, it, remind you guys about that. See, they, did, they didn't have pagers either. Do you know I still carry a pager at work? I can't, it's prehistoric. One, one of the new guys came and I said, you know what this is? It's texting except that you can't write back. It just, you get the message. It's very foreign. Anyway, so Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests of the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, thank God he did. Because how many times are we in a scary situation where we're like, I don't know how this is going to go. And I, I think that's a blessing for him. But he went out and asked them, who is it you want? What's the deal here? And they said, oh, Jesus of Nazareth. And is what they replied, I am he, Jesus said. Judas was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You understand that there was so much power in him even declaring his own name. You know, it says further in the Bible, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He says to ask in his name and it will be granted. There is so much power in the name of Jesus. These guards came to arrest him and he declared himself as Jesus. They fell to the ground. You know what we would do? Run. Not Jesus. See, there's, there's power in self-control. And there's control in self-control. Jesus didn't run. He waited for them to get back up, straighten themselves up. Can you imagine with that much power, he could have overtaken them? It wasn't a question of whether or not he was subdued. He freely went. It was his own choice. Anybody ever tried to load a bull in the trailer that won't go? So, so there's a lot of power there. Okay? And it's very, very difficult to change their minds. And typically it entails another day, especially once they've broke the fences. So, Jesus could have been the bull. He could have declared himself. He could have done anything. And he didn't. He chose self-control because there's more power in it. It's interesting, sometimes we want to fight. We want to come out fighting mad on, on different things. And sometimes we do need to fight. But it's amazing how much power is in self-control. Think of your own circumstances when you have a conflict of interest, a difference of opinion. There's power. Sometimes in keeping your mouth shut. Even when you know you're right. Because it's not worth the battle. Choose your battles. In this point, Jesus stood back and he kept his mouth shut. They fell down. And then he says, hey, I told you, I'm he. If you're looking for me, let these men go. <coughs> this happened so the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I've not lost one of those you gave me. Then Peter, you guys know I love Peter because he's just like me. He is. And I always want to remind you because we always talk about Peter when he's sinning. Remember, he was the first pope. Okay? So he, he may have made some mistakes, but he wasn't all messed up. So Peter had a sword and he drew it back and he cuts off guy's ear. Now, can you imagine Jesus is going, oh, 
Come on, Peter. Please. Not right now. Have you ever been with somebody when you're like trying to tell them to throttle it back? Eh, not so. Come on. It's not that big of a... It, I get it. And then what did Jesus do? He put the guy's ear back on. That's amazing. That's self-control. Guy that's going to take him into jail, he puts his ear back on. To me, that'd be a big deal. I don't, I, you might get a pass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'd be thinking that's one of those get out of jail free cards. But the guy didn't do that. Jesus said, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup of the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him. Why? Why? He already proved he had more power than they did. And they still had to bound him. What? I don't get it. Make him feel good, I guess. And then they brought him on, and he goes on for his trial. To die for his people. There's control in self-control. And there's more happiness. Because when you're grinding with somebody, it doesn't make the situation better. It doesn't make you happier. Everybody loves fighting. A fight with a relative. Go to a family reunion. I got invited to a family reunion last night by accident, I think. <laughs> they were fighting. It's very interesting. Families do that. People do that. Do you think that's joyful? When people are fighting, when people have conflict with each other, it doesn't work. There's not happiness. Sometimes it's perfectly acceptable to just have self-control and keep your mouth shut because there's control in it. It fixes things. In many, many cases. Point number three. It feels good to do to others. Oh, missed one note, sorry. And that goes back to the fruit of the Spirit, right? Self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's an evidence that I'm a Christian when I have self-control. So point number three, it feels good to be good to others. It feels good to be good to others. We talk about our church blessing people when they're in need, providing benevolence and things like that. Specifically, there are people in our church that are a part of that ministry that carry that out. It's a call that God has put in their heart that they want to help do. And it feels good. I'm not one of the people that goes and do that. I don't. I know about it. I know what we're doing. But I'm not the person going and doing that most of the time. It is wonderful to hear the praise reports and the testimonies when somebody's been blessed by our church. It's wonderful to hear outside of a church function when, when somebody's car broke down and somebody's animals got out, anything that the people in our church go and help somebody else. I've heard of hot water heaters being fixed, cars being fixed, lawnmowers being fixed, items on houses being fixed, people being picked up when they're stranded, all sorts of stuff from our church. They didn't call the church and say, hey, we need to have somebody come help us. No, they were able to count on somebody else in the church because it's what we do for each other, and it feels good. It absolutely feels good, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. It gives us joy to help others. It's a wonderful thing. We are going to go to Exodus chapter 36, 1 through 7. This is some old school business here. So this is, the background is, they are ready to build the temple. So Moses goes to everybody and says, hey, we need, we need to build the temple. We need people to help. As you guys, I told you guys, I forgot for the last three weeks when to, when to ask for offering. I'll, I'll work on that. It's not the priority in our church to ask for money. It's just not what we do. That's not how we focus. Do we need it to help and do? Sure. But that's not our focus. But just like that, in this tabernacle, they needed to build this. So Moses reaches out to everybody and says, Hey, we need to get this tabernacle built. This is what we need to do. And so people start to bring things. And it says, So Moses summoned Bezalel and Oliab. And every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability and who was willing to come and do the work. So first they had workers, and then they had stuff. And you need both. Right? We need both. This piano doesn't play itself. 
We have a worker. We have stuff. That's how it goes. So they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. The Israelites were so excited to do good. They were bringing stuff. And the people continued to bring free will offerings. So there's a difference. Not only were they given their tithe, they were given more because they wanted to see this happen. They were wanting to be a part of something good because it feels good. It didn't just start in the 19th century when it felt good to help other people. It's felt good to help other people for eons. It's an innate thing that Christ put inside every one of us. We were created with the desire to help each other. We want to work together with other people. That's how we function. So they continued to bring them and all the skilled workers who were doing all the work left what they were doing because they became overwhelmed. It doesn't say it in the scripture, but obviously that's what happened. And they went to Moses and they said, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. And so then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. Again, they didn't, weren't able to put an advertisement on Facebook or send out text messages, so they sent word. That's what I used to do when we were kids. I was the one that whatever news happened in the house. Because what my parents didn't have cell phones as a kid. That none of that, you know. I guess cell phones kind of existed, but they were way beyond our level of buying one. So, Dad would get home from work, and it was my responsibility to run to the car to tell him all the day's information before mom could get to him. Dad called me the informer. <laughs> oh, oh, here's the informer. What, what, what happened today? And I'd tell him, oh, such and such, so and so's coming over. This is happening. Guess what mom did? <laughs> you know? Whatever it was, I was the informer. Dad loved it. He was like, oh, great. You know? it, I think it helped him brace to know if mom was going to be in a bad mood based on how my brother and I had acted that day. So he could kind of prepare himself. Nobody likes to come home and the mom's like hair is standing straight up and just hands you the kids and says, they're yours. I'm done. I'm done. I'm going outside. <laughs> so dad got a little bit of a, but this is how they're sending word. Anyway, they send word throughout the camp. And they're like, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so all the people were restrained from being more because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. What a testimony. Do you think that church was growing? Do you think that church was rocking? Do you think that church did great? That tabernacle was rocking. That's our heart's desire. It's good to do good. It feels good to do good. And it is almost exciting when you see things or hear things and somebody gets blessed. It's like, wow, I love it. I'm glad we do that at our church. And we find ourselves doing more and wanting to do more and help in other ways. And that the Lord's hand is in that. And that is part of fulfilling the fruits of the Spirit. And that is part of showing how we are Christians. Because it feels good to do good. It's not just giving money. It's giving of yourself. And it's whatever God puts in your heart for you to do in that particular situation at that particular point in time. So conclusion. Evidence of Christianity. John 13, 35 says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And we fulfill it. Evidence again of our Christianity. Working it out and having love for one another. Doesn't mean you're running around smooching everybody. The point is, is that we give each other enough mutual respect that we care about one another. We care about their families. Point number two, I'm in control when I have self-control. We talked about Jesus' self-control. We talked about my lack thereof. But in Titus chapter 1 verse 8 it says, Rather, he must be hospitable... One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. That's what we're trying to be. That's what we're striving. We want to be upright. We want to be holy and disciplined. doesn't mean we walk on water. It means we give it our best. As anybody knows, that's all I can do. Point number three, it feels good to be good to others. It absolutely does. Philippians 1.7 says, 
It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Paul's sitting here saying, hey, I care about all of you. And all of you are going to get a partake in the great things that we have. And that's what we want to do for each other. That's how we want to help each other. That, that is the part of our lives that make it so fulfilling. We want to do good. And it gives us joy. And it gives us peace. It gives us all sorts of exciting things. We want to share. It's so interesting that the news media is finding that they have to make a conscious effort to have stories about good things. Bobby Bones has the radio, uh, radio show in the morning. And one of the one things he says is, tell me something good. They want to say one thing good. Because everybody hears so many bad things, but we innately desire to hear those great stories. You'll hear a great story and it'll go fi viral over the internet. You'll see a great video clip of a, a parent being a wonderful parent or somebody doing some wonderful act of kindness or an animal being nice to another animal and that will be viral. Because it feels good to do good. We want to do good. But it's in us because it's evidence of our walk with Christ. And the more that we do good for others, the more that we're blessed. And the more that we have control, the more we're able to control. Sometimes we're so busy grappling, thinking we need to have control, we just sit tight. We'll be okay. The biggest thing, maybe this is a good lesson for you guys. You teach it when you're driving high speeds in a car. High speeds, everybody says 10 and 2. How many race car drivers you see have their hands up here? Hands are down here. Any cop? Most of them at high speeds, their hands are down here. Why? Because you can't overcorrect. You can only go to here to here. You can make high speed lane changes. You can make maneuvers. Your hands are here. It's so important. So you have control. But when the vehicle goes out of control, what's the first thing they used to teach us in police academy? Hands on chest. Hands on chest. Why? Because your vehicle auto autocorrects. And I, I've proven it. I've proven it. More than once, I have felt myself spinning out of control, throw my hands off the wheel and let it autocorrect and grab it back and go under control. That's how you do it. It's our own lives. Control what you can control and let go what you can't or shouldn't because there is control in self-control and you've got to remember your own rules. Will you please stand with me? We as the Car Community Church will always present Christ's open doors of heaven to everybody. If you'd like to make Jesus your Savior, you simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Come into my heart and I will serve you with all of my ability. If you prayed this prayer, we believe you have begun the Christian transformation. If you want to know more or it's simply like prayer, feel free to come up during the last song. Lord God, we come to you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything you do in our lives to help us fulfill the fruits of the Spirit. I speak blessings over this congregation, over everybody watching, Lord. Hold us close. Protect our thoughts. Protect our movement, Lord. Remind us of your unfailing hand. Pour your favor on us as we walk out our specific purpose this week. Remind us of your daily miracles, Lord, and strengthen us when we're weak. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your love. Give us divine approval. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are singing. Let me see.